thank you all for joining us this week for our second Zoom uh, GAR Hall special event. Um, we've still got a little technical thing, so please bear with us if there's a little glitch, but I think we're, we're pretty good to go. Um, last week, it was great. Um, we worked out some bugs, so I think we're going to be okay this week. So um, there is no charge for this. You know, if we were going to the GAR hall, there, there would be a charge. We are offering these. Um, they're open to anybody, and they are free um, to join us. If you care to make a donation, we appreciate that, but it is definitely not required. I've put up our PayPal information and our mailing address in the chat. So if you did want to make a donation, that's all your information. Um, if you have a question, please hold it to the end. Put it in the chat section. Christopher will answer those questions for you at the end. Please keep your mics muted. Um, Christopher will be back with us again in November. He'll be doing a presentation called um, 1620, the first year, which we can all guess what that's all about. So it'll be about the Pilgrims, their first year. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And next week we have got um, Delvin Case, who is going to be doing a presentation on the music of the Beatles. He is a professor, a music professor. He is a conductor. He has written operas. He's, you're going to love him. So anyways, that's next week. But now we have got Christopher Daly, who was with us in March. He was actually the last in-person um, mm -hmm. event that we had. He did the talk on the Irish, need not apply. Christopher is a educator. He is a historian. He's an author. He's done lots of television stuff. Some of his credits, when you look through them, you'll know the TV shows he's worked on. Um, and we're very excited to have him back with us. So with that, I'm gonna turn that over to you. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of weird for me. Uh, I've been doing these lectures for about, oh, 25 years, and um, this is my maiden voyage into Zoom land. Uh, so um, to a little bit about this lecture. This was the first lecture I ever developed. I started working on this back in 1992. It started as a regular slideshow. You remember the old Clippy slideshows? And uh, it evolved over time. Uh, and uh, all these years later, uh, this, this subject is still very poignant, especially in today's world. If you look at the time of Sacco and Vanzetti, it was a time of great political strife. Uh, there was mass immigration into this country. Uh, we were working with a recovering economy. There were high crime rates and there were threats of terrorism. I think we can all relate to that. And uh, when we look at this, the story of Sacco and Vanzetti, I, I think uh, it, it really uh, personifies the, the, the saying that uh, history kind of repeats itself. So without any further ado, I'll, I'll start out here. Let's get this uh, going. Now, if you know anything about the Sacco and Vanzetti case, you may know that there was a big robbery and a murder in Braintree, Mass. Well, in fact, there were two robberies involved in this case. And the first one happened in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. And this robbery, or I should say attempted robbery, happened on December 24th, 1919 at 7.30 a.m. Let me tell you the scenario here. It was a, a snowy morning, much like the photograph you see here, just a coating. And there was a payroll of $15,000 that was to leave this bank. This is the Bridgewater Savings Bank in Bridgewater. And this, this payroll in cash was to go to the LQ White Shoe Factory. Now, I wonder if anybody remembers ever getting paid in cash unless it was under the table. But back in the 1920s, people were paid in cash. And that's how they did it. So they had to take all this money and transport it down to the LQ White Shoe Factory to pay off the help. Now, this is exactly the type of truck that they use. This is a Ford pickup. And it was covered with a canvas top, just like you see. 
They took out the payroll. It was bolted to the back of the truck. Ben Bowles, who was the constable, sat on that. Earl Graves was the driver and the paymaster. Alfred Cox was sitting by his side in the driver's seat. And they began the drive to LQ White Shoe Factory, which was just down Broad Street. Here's a photograph of LQ White Shoe Factory. Here's a, an actual postcard of the LQ White Shoe Factory. Pretty amazing. People actually uh, sent postcards of factories back then. Now, if you go to Bridgewater today, you will find this site, but it doesn't look anything like you see in this photograph. This is what you will find. That is the MBTA parking lot at Bridgewater. Now, as I said, I started doing this lecture back in the 1990s, and there was still some remnants of the factory back then. And if you take a look, here's a photograph I took back then. You can still see the foundations back in 1992. That parking lot hadn't been built there. The MBTA wasn't even running back then. And I did some investigation. And I'm here to tell you folks that, yes, I found the last soul at the LQ White Shoe Factory. Well, let's look at the map here. Here's the location of the bank. Here is the location of LQ White Shoe Factory. Now that payroll truck was supposed to move down Broad Street and take the payroll here. Now this street was also uh, ha had an electric car line going down it, or a trolley car, you might say. And there was a trolley car that had pulled out and was moving down the street just as that pickup truck was leaving. It got just about to the location of Hale Street, and they stopped to take on some passengers. This is a photograph of Hale Street, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Broad Street at the time. And here we have Hale Street, that midpoint. Now, as that trolley car was just pulling away, and that payroll truck was coming up behind it on its way to LQ White, all of a sudden, this black touring car came out of nowhere and screeched over into the corner. And what happened was three individuals jumped out of that car, ran towards the payroll truck. One of them had a pump-style shotgun. He, he dog-trotted out front and called for the driver to stop. Now, the driver didn't stop. What he did was he slammed on the gas, whipped that truck around the trolley as it was pulling out and gunfire was exchanged. A shotgun uh, blast and pistol fire was exchanged. The, the uh, guard fired shots. And what happened was that this truck eventually sped on down Broad Street, as you see in this map, and crashed into a telephone pole. Now, uh, what happened was uh, the bandits saw that their, their uh, opportunity had been lost and they jumped back into that touring car and sped off down Hale Street. Some people think they headed off towards Plymouth. We really don't know. The police tried to track them in the, in the snow, but they were unsuccessful. So this was an unsuccessful payroll robbery attempt. Here's the evidence that was left. There was a spent Winchester shotgun shell found at the scene. It was ejected from that shotgun. Also, numerous eyewitnesses uh, witnessed uh, this robbery. There were many people on that trolley. There were people just looking out their windows. Uh, there was a boy that was going to school. Uh, the, the typical eyewitness account was that they, these gentlemen were dark and swarthy looking. Some people said they looked Italian. I, if you have if there's an Italian look, I don't know. Uh, the shotgun bandit was described as thus. He was about 5'7", dark, had a short, croppy mustache. That meant that it was clipped. It was cropped uh, closely. And that he was the one with the shotgun. The other two were smaller than him. They were clean shaven. This was the description of these bandits. 
Now, one eyewitness was actually able to write down the number on the license plate. And this is how we connect the two robberies, Bridgewater and Braintree, because two license plates were stolen from the same garage and each of those was used in one of these robberies. So they believed mm -hmm. that the same gang was doing this. An investigation ensued. The LQ White Shoe Factory posted a thousand dollar reward for any information leading to the capture and prosecution of these bandits. Now, they called in the Pinkerton Detective Agency and you might have heard of the Pinkertons because they were the original private eyes. And the Pinkertons were called in because the, usually the local police constabulary was not really very good at investigating crimes such as robbery, murder. They were more investigating, usually investigating uh, domestic uh, issues, uh, hauling drunks off to jail, things of that nature. So they weren't very skilled in these type of things. So that's why they called in the Pinkertons. They were professional detectives. And Bridgewater Police Chief Michael Stewart begins his investigation. Here's a picture of Michael Stewart. He was in his early 40s. He had been a police officer uh, earlier and uh, ascended to uh, the chief position. Uh, the whole police department of Bridgewater consisted of him and two or three other men. There was a night man and a, and a day man. And that was the, the whole police department of Bridgewater. And I must say, if there's some people out there, you may know this, Michael Stewart later on in his life retired to the town of Situate. Maybe some of you actually knew him. He begins his investigation. He assists the Pinkerton agents. The first thing they come up with is they find out that these license plates uh, were stolen from a place called Hassam's Garage in Needham. Now, they interviewed Mr. Hassam, and he said, oh. Mr. Hassam said to the police that uh, a man who was described as dark, swarthy looking with a shortly cropped mustache appeared one day and asked if he could borrow his, his uh, dealer plates because he had a car that needed to move, be moved. Mr. Hassam denied this. He said, no, you cannot. And the man was angrily huffed off. And later that day, they discovered that two of their license plates had been stolen. Now, if you look at this description of this man, he was dark, swarthy, had a short, croppy mustache. Sounds a lot like our shotgun bandit. Hmm. And then they spread out far and wide. They went to speakeasies, pool rooms, with an ear out to any information on this robbery. And they found an informant that was in a speakeasy and he overheard somebody named C.A. Barr talking about that he knew something about this crime. So what happened was the Pinkertons and Chief Stewart decided to do a stakeout at the home of C.A. Barr. Now this is where he lived. He lived at 31 Waverly Street in Brighton, Massachusetts, right up in this third floor apartment here. And they didn't have air conditioning back then either. Now, they, they observed his movements for several days. And uh, if you're ever interested, you can find a source. The Pinkertons actually produced a report. And they sat there and then they would follow him. He would leave in the morning and he would go into Boston and along the way, he would make many, many stops. He'd go into grocery stores. He'd go into uh, different places, apartment buildings, almost as if he was collecting or distributing something. And uh, my difficulty with that report was that these agents never speculated what they thought he was doing. I think maybe he was a bag man or maybe he was involved with bootlegging or something. We really don't know. Now, eventually they decided to confront C.A. Barr and see what he did know. And they waited for him to come home one day. And by the way, C.A. Barr was described as about 5'7", dark, swarthy looking, having a closely cropped mustache. Does that sound familiar? 
Well, they began to interview him, and he, he wove this fantastical story. He told the police officers that he had a machine that he could look into and see crimes be committed. This is in the days before television. There was no such kind of machine. And they let him talk. And he said, I, I looked into this machine. And what I saw was this crime of being committed. And it was a group of anarchists. And they live in a shack in Bridgewater. Now, I can imagine what the police were doing. They were probably looking at each other and thinking, this guy is a Fruit Loop. He's, he's crazy. And you know... If you follow that record, you never hear about C.A. Barr ever again. They just dropped him at that point. But the seed was planted. Anarchists in a shack, and he said someplace in Bridgewater. They were the culprits because he saw this in a machine. Now, for years and years and years, I've wondered who C.A. Barr was. In fact, I came across a, a grand niece. And she didn't even know too much about him. All she knew, he was some kind of herbalist, I guess. But I did find a news article that uh, was about him. By his way, by the way, he was a, a Sicilian. His full name was Carmine Barrasso. Now, Barrasso, C.A. Barr, had a little uh, scuffle with the law a little bit later from this. Here's the article. It seems that he was going through the turnstile at the subway and tried to use uh, a slug. I don't know if any of you remember those things. And the police were right there. They had him red-handed. What did he do? He pulled two vials of acid out of his pocket and threw it in their face. So we know that C.A. Barr was not a great guy from this. He was arrested, he was brought to trial, and somehow the charges were dropped. And we never hear about C.A. Barr ever again. But. I think he was crazy, crazy like a fox, because he matched the shotgun description, shotgun bandit description to AT. So that brings us to the big robbery that we've all heard of, the one in South Braintree. This happened April 15, 1920. The incident happened at 3 p.m. But we're going to go back. We're going to go back and, and tell about what happened that day. And we're also going to tour a little bit around South Braintree as it looked in 1920, 1992 when I first started doing this and what it looks like now. Here's a map of South Braintree. This is Pearl Street as you see here. Uh, there's some major buildings that you're going to see photographs of. Right here, this is the Hampton House, big mansard and roof house. This is where the offices for the factories were. This is where the payroll was counted. The American Express office was here. This is where the payroll came in from the train station. The two factories were the Rice and Hutchins and the Slater and Morrill, which is down in the corner here. And at the time, the railroad went across the road here. You'll see the water tower. You'll see the, the Rice and Hutchins. And a restaurant was being completed around that time. So let's take a little tour through time here. Braintree through the years. This is looking down the street. You can see the water tower. Here's the factories. Um, the the uh, Hampton House would have been over here. You can't see that. And this is Pearl Street. This is what it looked like, almost that same view in 1992. Nothing was left. There was just a bare, vacant lot there at that time. Uh, I did go in there, and there were remnants of the foundation. Uh, the chimney was still left at that time. Here is the factory. That is the Rice and Hutchins factory. In 1992, this is all that was left, that, that rail fence, which will come into our story a little bit later. Here is that view. Rice and Hutchins is right here. Slater Morrill is that water tower I was telling you about. And there's that rail fence. If you look very closely, there's a little house down the street. And in 1992, that was all about all that was left. You still see that house there. So this area has changed quite a bit. Here are some shots from present day. This is the Hampton House. This is where the offices were, the payroll was counted. 
And today, if you go there today, this is what it looks like. Um, this is the Rice and Hutchins factory. If you go there today, this is what it looks like. It's now a strip mall. And the old railroad crossing in the Hampton House. Now there is an overpass that goes over the street. So this area is, is unrecognizable from what it looked like in 1920. Let's go back to our story here. It really starts in the morning. It started around 9.18 a.m. in the morning. The American Express agent, whose name was Shelley Neal, had his office right here, went to the train station to pick up a payroll of $33,000, which was to be counted out up in the offices here of the Hampton House by the secretaries. And then around 3 p.m., it would be brought down by the paymaster and distributed to the men. Now, Shelley Neal, um, was supposed to pick up that payroll. It was supposed to be about nine o'clock in the morning, but the train was late. It showed up at about 918. They took the metal boxes off of the train and they put it onto buckboards. Here's another shot of the station. This was taken in the 1950s. Uh, a buckboard with two horses, believe it or not, in 1920. And that was just to bring it down the street to the offices of, Sl of Slater and Morrill and Rice and Hutchinson's at the Hampton House. As you see here, here is the American Express office. That's where Shelley Neal had his office. That was where he would bring the payroll. And once it was secured, he would bring it upstairs to the offices here. Now that morning when he and his men were transporting those boxes, he noticed a man standing about where this gentleman is here. This man was described as tall, blonde, pale, sickly look, looking, almost as if he had tuberculosis. He was wearing a scally cap down over his eyes and had a World War I trench coat on, just leaning against that wall there where you see that gentleman. Now, Shelly Neal had to walk past him to get to his door, and he suspected that there was going to be a robbery. He later recounted that he, he had his hand on his pistol, which was in his pocket. And he walked right by this gentleman. The gentleman did nothing more than look up and make eye contact with him, and that was it. Shelly Neal and the men got the payroll into the office, shut the door, and then went upstairs and looked out the window. Now, this uh, blonde man was still sitting there, and two cars were outside on the street that he noticed. One of the men from one of the cars said, come on, let's go to the man sitting by the, uh, standing on the wall there, and he jumped into the car. The other car was uh, pointed in the opposite direction, and they just kind of motored off simultaneously. Now, Shelly Neal thought that was extremely odd because he knew everybody, and he knew whose car was what. In, in 1920, there weren't too many cars. So these men were strangers. They weren't supposed to be there. My, my take on this was they were making sure that payroll was there for the day because uh, all the payroll robberies, they were alternating days and trying to keep people off guard because you wouldn't have a, a standard payday uh, because of these robberies. So these cars were seen throughout the area. Uh, it was this Buick car and they were seen loitering in the area throughout the day. They were seen at the railroad station. They were seen in front of the hardware store. At one point, they were in front of the factories with a man underneath trying to fix the car as if it was uh, broken. Um, a woman who was looking for a job actually asked one of them where the employment office was. And she later recounted in a, in a clear American accent, he said, it's over at Rice and Hutchins. This brings us to three o'clock. This is the Hampton House. All the payroll had been counted by the secretaries and the paymaster and his guard. Paymaster was Frederick Parmenter and this is Alessandro Baradelli, his guard. Got up and they had, each had steel boxes that they were to carry in both hands. 
Now, usually they would do like they did in Bridgewater and put it in the truck and drive it down. But because it was a beautiful April day, Parmenter thought it would be a good idea to walk the payroll down to the factories. So they came down this fire escape here, this, this outside uh, uh, stairway, and started, literally, they began the last walk of their lives. Here they came out of here and they crossed, crossed over through the uh, railroad crossing. They said hi to Mike Labangi, who was the gate tender. And they got down to about here. <clears throat> and they ran into a gentleman by the name of Jimmy Bostock, who was uh, one of the mechanics. He fixed the, the machines. And he was off to Brockton because he had, uh, they had a shoe factory over there that needed uh, machines being fixed. Said hi to Jimmy Bostock. And then they continued down that road toward the factories. Now, as they approached Rice and Hutchins that you see here, they noticed on this fence here were two men. One was kind of facing the other way, leaning over the fence. The other one was up on his elbows, kind of reclining. And that right there should have set off red flags because it, this is a factory town. Nobody is taking breaks. Nobody's having a cigarette because they did piece work. And if you stopped your machine, you were losing money. They smoked at their machines. They ate at their machines. Nobody was outside taking breaks. So that must have set off some kind of an alarm. But the two payroll, uh, the paymaster and his guard continued to walk down the middle of the street here with Parmenter on the right, Baradelli on the left. And as they approached these two men, who are right about this location here, one of the men turned around, jumped off the fence, grabbed Baradelli by the, the left-hand shoulder, and shot him twice in the back. Baradelli went down to his knees. Parmenter, who was a little bit beyond, began to run. Most witnesses say the same man shot him twice. He shot him, hit him in the back, which flipped Parmenter around so he was facing the gunman. The gunman fired another shot and hit him in the chest. Parmenter ended up falling in the gutter just about here. Now, as Parmenter is staggering and falling, Baradelli is trying to get back up. He's on his knees facing the gunman. And the gunman starts pointing his gun up into the factory windows because people are starting to look. And then he dances around the back of Baradelli and then fires two more shots point blank down into his back and Baradelli goes down. Now this is one version of the shooting. There is another version too. After this, the getaway car was signaled. It had been waiting and it came up the street the other version is that there was one gunman on the running board that ran off the running board and just went over and took one shot at Baradelli. <clears throat> Most of the eyewitnesses, like 90% of them, said one gunman was doing all the shooting. And even the autopsy evidence, if you look at the autopsy evidence, it's consistent with what I told you about the shooting in the, in the back and the front. Now, they piled into the car, they took the payroll, and they sped off towards the gate. They got to the railroad, and Mike Levangi had actually closed the gates because the train was coming. <clears throat> and they stuck their guns in his face and said, open up this thing, USOB, or we'll shoot you. So he opened up the gate, and they sped off down Pearl Street. <clears throat> and they took a left onto Washington Street. Some say on two wheels. And it said that they threw tacks out the back window because if anybody was trying to chase them, they would have gotten flat tires. Now, what was the evidence? The evidence that was left. Spent semi-automatic pistol shells. A man's cap was left at the scene. Bullets. <clears throat> the bullets recovered. There were um, four bullets recovered from Baradelli, two from Parmenter. <clears throat> and a witness wrote down the license plate number. That license plate was 
traced to one of the two that was stolen at Hassam's. So they believed this was the same gang that did the Bridgewater robbery as did the Braintree robbery. Now, this is the route of the getaway car. And many people spotted this getaway car because it was going at the extreme high speed of 50 miles an hour. Here's the route. And then we lose it here because there are no sightings until we get to an area called Matfield Crossing. And then three days later, the getaway car is found in an area of Brockton called Manly Woods. Let me just turn this back here. Um, Manly Woods is right here. And they found it, there were two men that were off on a, a horse ride. They had uh, left from the Brockton Fairgrounds and went through the woods. And if you do that, you end up in uh, Bridgewater. And uh, they found this getaway car. It was said to have a bullet hole in it and a small glass vial, which they thought maybe contained cocaine or something. All the police descended upon this car. Even Chief Stewart arrived. And he was quoted as looking at it and saying, these men knew no God. Now that's kind of telling. If you're familiar with anarchists at all, they, uh, they also are, um, also they have no religion. Yes, they're also atheists. So I'm wondering, when I hear that quote at this early stage in the game, I wonder if he's already thinking that these bandits were anarchists. Which brings us to something that was happening uh, at the same time, the Red Scare. Now, you might have heard of the Red Scare, the Red Scare in the 20s, and also there was a so-called Red Scare in the 1950s. This all came about as a result of uh, the actions during World War I when the Bolshevik Revolution happened over in Russia. The Bolsheviks, the communists, took over Russia. And we were deathly afraid over here. Americans were deathly afraid that these radicals, these communists, were going to come over here and do the same thing and take over and there'd be massive bloodshed. And they called them reds because that was the color of the Soviet Union. Now, under this heading, uh, it was very, very broad and general heading, reds. If you were a red, you could be a, a radical communist, socialist, or an anarchist. And in some cases, their philosophies are very, very different. Now, the anarchists were the ones that you really had to worry about because they like to blow up things. Case in point, May 1, 1919. 36 mail bombs were sent out to leading capitalists, judges, government officials all across the country. Now, Luckily enough, none of them were killed by these bombs. There was only one incident. Uh, I believe it was J.P. Morgan's maid opened up one of these bombs and blew her arms off. Now, you would think that these people would know that leading capitalist millionaires would not open their own mail, but uh, this, this started a panic. These people were sending bombs in the mail and uh, a panic ensued. The Attorney General of the United States, A. Mitchell Palmer, was on the case. He was doing investigation. And they were formulating a response to this. Now, after a hard day at work, A. Mitchell Palmer was uh, home. He uh, had gone home, had dinner with his wife. It was evening. He was getting settled for the evening. He had a nice book. He was going to lay down in bed and read his book until he fell asleep. That was his normal routine. And just as he sat on the bed, an explosion went off, blowing his front porch off. Here's another shot of that. Palmer 
was uninjured, but he was thrown from his bed. He and his wife were thrown from their bed, glass shattered all over the place. The children in the bedrooms were uninjured. And it, they were very, very lucky because this anarchist that did this bombing came very close, except for he made one little mistake. As he was coming up the stoop, he didn't want look where his feet were, and he tripped over one of the indentations in the steps, fell on his own bomb, and blew himself to smithereens. That anarchist was later found to be Carlo Valdinocci. Now, when they cleaned up the mess, they found bits and pieces of him all over the neighborhood. They found his scalp on the roof. They found pieces of his clothing on buildings. In fact, uh, the scalp was found on the roof of the uh, Secretary of Navy. His name was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was also carrying a, a wad of literature that was probably going to be dispersed uh, after he had blown up uh, the A. Mitchell Palmer. But in, instead, it was blown all over the neighborhood. It was these little leaflets. And here is a copy of one of them. If you take a look, it's called Plain Words, and I don't expect you to read all this, but in, in essence, this was a diatribe against capitalism. It was a diatribe against people who had power and government. Now, the anarchists believed that you shouldn't, there should be no government, there should be no power, everybody should work collectively. And they wanted to start a revolution by blowing things up, and that's exactly what they were doing. Now, a. Mitchell Palmer put his best man in the Department of Justice on this. You might know this man, J. Edgar Hoover. This would be his case. And this is what propelled him to the head of the, uh, the agency that would later become known as the FBI. It was found that these flyers were from uh, a group of anarchists called Grupo Autonomo. They ran between New York and uh, Boston. And uh, this is the man they followed. Uh, anarchists claim that they don't have any leaders, but this is the man that, he was, he was the philosophical head of the group here, Luigi Galliani. And he had his own newsletter that many people subscribed to. And the Department of Justice had the list of subscribers. So they knew who all these anarchists were. Now, this, this Chronica Subversiva, uh, they propagated a philosophy called uh, propaganda of the deed, which meant uh, blowing things up and causing havoc and causing society to collapse so anarchy can arise out of that. Now, this panic went into full swing. The government reacted, and they started to deport any foreign radical, socialist, communist, anarchist that they could get their hands on. These are cartoons from the period. This is how people thought of them. If you can think of how we thought of terrorists, this is how people thought of these anarchists. Here are some more images to look at. Here they are. They're being round up by the government. Many of them were foreign radicals. Just broken down doors and get your bags, we're taking you and we're going to put you on a ship and send you to Russia. And that's exactly what they did. No hearings, nothing. You're on this ship, see you later. You want to be a red, go to Russia. Here is an actual film clip of people being arrested and rounded up during this period. Emma Goldman, Alexander Berkman were the, the, probably the most prominent anarchists at the time. They were deported and never allowed to come back. I think Emma Goldman was allowed back for a few days in 1940, but that was it. Now, Sacco and Vanzetti were among these anarchists, but for some reason, they hadn't been notified to leave yet. They must have missed them. Now, that flyer that they found all over the place from Valdinochi, 
it was traced back to the printing plant where it was printed, and it was owned by two anarchists, Robert Elia and Andrea, Andrea Salcedo, and they were thought to be an intricate part of this Grupo Autonomo, this group that was following Luigi Galliani. And they were arrested by the Department of Justice and brought to this building on Park Ave. And they were interrogated for two weeks on the 15th floor of this building. Now, what happened was both of them probably broke. They gave up all of their uh, Confederates. They gave up all of their friends who were anarchists. And on the night of May 3rd, 1920, an incident happened. Salcedo either was thrown out the window or jumped out the window of the 14th story of the Justice Department building. Now, there are a few different takes on this. The anarchists themselves who are out there on the ground still at liberty think now they're killing us. They're throwing us out the windows. The other side of it is that Salcedo had broke. He had given up his friends and he probably felt remorse and jumped out the window committing suicide. I think the latter is probably more likely. This brings us to a little shack in Bridgewater, West Bridgewater to be exact. This was the home to Faruko Kawachi, who was one of, this, one of these anarchists from the group. And he got a notice to be deported, oddly enough, on April 15th, 1920, the same day as the robbery in Braintree. And he did not report for deportation. And the uh, immigration inspector called uh, Chief Stewart and said, this guy hasn't shown up. Can you go over there and find out why? And Chief Stewart told him that, well, I can't go out there myself. I am rehearsing for a play tonight and I will send my deputy over. So he sent his deputy, whose name was Bruyard, over to find out what was the story with this Kawachi who was living in the shack in Bridgewater. And he came uh, in the nighttime and Kawachi was there and Kawachi said, oh, my wife, was, she was a sick. I couldn't go. I'm going. My bags are packed. I'll be going tomorrow. And Bruyard reported back to Stewart the next day, your Stewart, that he thought something was fishy over there. And Stewart decided that he would go over and investigate himself and find out what was going on with this anarchist, Faruko Kawachi. So he approached the building knocked on the door, and this man appeared. His name was Mario Buda. He had anglicized it to Mike Boda. Now, Stewart had no idea who he was talking to. Mike Boda, Mario Buda, was one of the most rabid anarchists, violent anarchists in the group. He was the bomb maker. Now, a couple months after Sacco and Vanzetti would be arrested, this is how Mike Boda took revenge. This is the famous Wall Street bombing. Now, what we know is somebody pulled a, car a cart with a donkey onto Wall Street at about lunchtime when the street was full of people and it was on a timer. It had hundreds of pounds of dynamite and ball bearings. <clears throat> the bomb went off, killing 30 people, injuring hundreds more. Here are some more shots. It's thought that Mike Boda was responsible for this. And again, I'm, I'm kind of foreshadowing. This was in the future. They call it the first car bomb even though it was in a car. If you, even if you go to Wall Street today, you can still see the pock marks in the wall from those ball bearings. And you know what, I, I went down there a couple years ago and uh, something that I did not realize, and it's very, uh, very poignant, was that this site is one block away from the World Trade Center. 
and there I am at that same site. So back to Mike Boder and Chief Stewart. This, this has yet to happen. Chief Stewart is talking to Mike Boder. He has no idea who he's talking to. And he enters the home and he, he's looking for Ruko Kawachi. And Mike Boda plays stupid. He says, oh, oh, he's, he's a gone. He's a, he's a bad man, that, the Kawachi. I, I didn't like him. And Stewart wanted to get some more information on Kawachi. So he asked Boda, he said, is there a photograph of Furoko uh, laying around or anything? So they began to walk throughout the house. <clears throat> and Stewart said to, to Boda, he said, did Kawachi own a, a weapon? Did he have a gun? And Mike Boda said, oh, yes, he did. He, he kept it in this drawer. And he opened the drawer. And there was a diagram of the gun that Kawachi owned. The gun was no, no longer there. It was a savage automatic pistol. And then Stewart looked at Boda and he said, hmm, how about you, my friend? Do you have a weapon? And Boda pulled this thing out of his belt. Steer automatic. At this point, Stewart said, why do you have that? And Boda said, oh, I am a macaroni salesman. I need a protection when I go to my customers. And in truth, Boda was a rabid anarchist, one of the worst, and he was also a bootlegger on the side. So that's probably why he had that pistol. And to this day, I don't know why he wasn't arrested on the spot. Even then, it was illegal to be carrying a weapon like that. Uh, Stewart let it slide, and he asked him to take him on through more of the house and the grounds. So then he took him out to, to the garage, and they went out there, and according to Stewart, there were uh, tracks from a Buick car. I, I guess he was an expert in tracks. And in the dirt, it looked like something had been buried. Uh, Stewart's theory later would be this is where the payroll had been hidden. And this, this whole area would be called the Bandit Shack eventually. This is how it looked in 1992. That garage was still there. If you go there today, garage is no longer there. Now, for some reason, Chief Stewart decided that he would uh, go back to the office and think about things. He, he left Boda and went back to the office. Uh, the next day, he had second thoughts and he went out to arrest Boda. Boda would later say he saw him coming up the street and he went out the back door and disappeared. Boda will make another appearance very shortly, though. Speaking of which, this, this is a garage just around the corner. This is uh, Simon Johnson's garage. It was in West Bridgewater at Elm Square. And uh, Simon Johnson, in early May, contacted uh, Chief Stewart. And he said to Chief Stewart, he said, uh, look, I've got this guy. His name's Mike Boda. And he left a car here to be repaired, and he's never come to pick it up. And it's a junk. It's an old jalopy. It's an overling. Can I just get rid of it and sell it for parts? And Chief Stewart was elated. He said, no, you hang on to that thing. And if that Boda character shows up, you give me a call, okay? That brings us to May 5th, 1920. Here's a map of West Bridgewater, and it's interesting to see the layout here. Uh, you have the getaway car was found over here. This is where Kawachi's house was. Simon Johnson's garage was right here, and his house was just up the street. Now, about 9 o'clock on May 5th, 1920, he uh, hears this motorcycle coming up his street, and it stops right in front of his house. Two men get out. Ricardo Orsiani and Mike Boda. Mike Boda comes up to the, the front door of Simon Johnson's house. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> Johnson uh, answers the door and Mike Boda is, says, I need that car. I need it right now. And Johnson knew that he had to call Chief Stewart because he was instructed to do so. 
So he made an excuse. He said, let me, let me go back and get my pants on. I'll be right with you. And he went in the back room and he told his wife, there's that Bodo. We have to contact Chief Stewart. The only problem was that they didn't have a phone. So they made up this story where Johnson's wife w was going to go next door to get some milk. She went past these two gentlemen and said, oh, I have to get some milk. I'll be right back. And meanwhile, Simon Johnson's in his bedroom stalling for time. The wife makes the phone call. She gets back. She tells him the word has been sent out. Chief Stewart wasn't there, though. He was at a play. A message was sent, though. So Simon Johnson comes back to the door. By this time, Mike Boda is really fidgeting. He's looking really nervous because I think he knows something's up. And immediately he changes his mind and he says, uh, forget it. Uh, I don't want the car. I'll come back later. I don't have any license plates. He and Orkiani jump in the motorcycle and they motor off. Now, as this was all going on, two men had walked up the street and had joined Boda while the wife was going looking for milk and all that stuff. These two men left and went up North Elm Street towards the trolley car. They were also anarchists. Um, I wonder if you can guess who they are. They got on the trolley car here at sunset and this trolley car, electric car was heading to Brockton. Now the word had gotten out, a message got to the Brockton Police uh, Department that these two men who were in West Bridgewater were heading his way. Officer Conley was on the desk. He was just eating his, his dinner around, uh, <clears throat> I think it was nine o'clock, 10 o'clock actually. When that trolley car rounded this corner, police, uh, police sergeant um, jumped on there and he took a look and it was almost a, a vacant car. Conley looked in the back and he could see these two men in the back. Now he had gotten a call that they had been involved in stealing a car. So he, it was kind of a garbled message. So he approached the two men and he looked at the one with the mustache and he said, what was you doing in Bridgewater? And he said, oh, I was visiting my friend of mine, Poppy. And he said, Poppy who? I don't know, his name's Poppy, wears a blue shirt. He used to work down at the Cordage in Plymouth. So Conley didn't like this. He, he thought they were kind of suspicious. So they were both arrested as having been suspicious characters. Now, what happened uh, was that they were brought, you can guess who they were. They were Sacco and Vanzetti. They were brought here. This is a fire station. And when I was doing my research, I kept coming on this date. They were brought to the police station at, at this, uh, I'm sorry, this address, and it confounded me. But then I realized that people were a little bit more economical back then, and this was a police station slash fire station. And they actually had cells in the back of the fire station, which are still there today. This is where they would bring people and hold them until they could bring them to the main police station up in the center of town. So Sacco and Vanzetti were put here, possibly put here for a short period, and then they were loaded onto the paddy wagon and brought up to the uh, main station. Now, Vanzetti had been frisked. He was found to be carrying a 38 uh, revolver loaded, fully loaded, and he had a shotgun shell on him. Sacco was lightly frisked, and Conley uh, didn't find anything, but as they were riding to the station, Conley would later remark that Sacco was making movements toward his jacket. And he kept saying, look, if you make another move and you'll, you're gonna be done for. Sacco listened. Later when they got to the station, Sacco was found to be carrying a 45 Colt automatic with 32 rounds of ammunition. This is the main station. They were brought in and they were questioned separately. Chief Stewart was alerted and uh, the district attorney was alerted, and these men were questioned. Now, the, the line of questioning went like this. Um, why were you in West Bridgewater? 
and they'd just be like, we were visiting a friend called Poppy. Okay, uh, who, is, uh, who is Mike Boda that you were with? We don't, we don't know Mike Boda. Okay, um, where, where do you live? Uh, Vanzetti said, I live in uh, Plymouth. I used to work at the Cordage factory. I now am a fish peddler. Okay, um, why were you carrying this and this? Oh, uh, my friend and I, Sacco, we were going to go out shooting. Uh, where did you buy this? Oh, I bought it in the North End, and I bought a box of ammunition to put in it. Okay, all right. Um, are you a member of the Black Hand? That was kind of what they called the Mafia back then. And Vanzetti Chuckley said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not part of the Black Hand. And then they said, are you an anarchist? And he paused, and he said, I like some things different. Didn't admit that he was an anarchist. Denied he was an anarchist. Uh, where were you on April 15th? He said he was uh, peddling fish. That's what I do every day. I'm peddling fish. That was the day of the robbery. So that was the, in essence, the questioning that Sacco went through, uh, Vanzetti went through. Sacco went through pretty much the same uh, questioning. Uh, they, they asked him why he was in Bridgewater. He couldn't give a good account of himself. He said he didn't know Boda, denied being an anarchist. They said, why were you carrying this thing? And how come you didn't give it to me when I frisked you? And he said, oh, I forgot it was there. That thing weighs, that thing weighs close to 10 pounds. And 32 rounds of ammunition, why are you carrying that? Oh, we're just going to go shooting. Plus, I, I work as an edge trimmer at the 3K Shoe Factory, in uh, Stoughton, and I am sort of like the nighttime security guard. That's why I have that weapon. Uh, and he, he um, told about uh, his job over in Stoughton and his boss and everything. And he denied that he was an anarchist. So these men were arrested, they were arraigned, and they were charged. Eventually, they uh, only Vanzetti would be charged as being the shotgun bandit in uh, Bridgewater. Both of them would be charged as having been bandits at the Braintree crime. So there were going to be two trials because Braintree and Bridgewater are in two different counties. Uh, Bridgewater being Plymouth County, uh, Braintree being uh, Norfolk County. So there was one trial at the beginning, Bartolomeo Vanzetti for the attempted whole uh, 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 robbery in Braintree. Now, the judge on the case was Judge Webster Thayer, and the DA on the case was uh, District Attorney Frederick Katzman. And just in a nutshell, this is what the trial went like very quickly. What was the evidence against Vanzetti? He was supposedly this shotgun bandit. Uh, they said that he lied under questioning. It was later proven that he was an anarchist. It was later proven that he knew Mike Boda. Why were you lying? Because you're guilty. That's called consciousness of guilt when you lie under questioning. Also, he was carrying a Winchester shotgun shell, uh, very much the same, similar to the one that was found at the scene of the robbery. And many witnesses identified him as being the shotgun bandit. Now, his attorney was pretty adept. His attorney challenged these identifications because he got a hold of the Pinkerton reports and found that the original identification said that the man had a short, crappy mustache. This was totally contested because Vanzetti, as you see, has a big walrus mustache. Many people came and testified that he'd always had that, even a policeman from North Plymouth where he lived on Cherry Street. Now, his defense... On, on the 24th of December was, he was selling fish. That's what he did. He was a fish peddler out on the street selling fish. And if you're Italian, you know, what do you eat the day before Christmas? Fish. So everybody in North Plymouth practically was a witness for him. Here's his actual fish cart. And many of his neighbors took the stand to testify that on that day, he was out selling what they called squigeal, which is eels, for them to eat. But many of them couldn't speak English. Many of them needed interpreters. 
and there wasn't one Italian on the jury. It was all old Yankees. And this, this young man took the stand. This is Beltrando Brini. And he would testify that he was with Vanzetti all day helping him sell fish. Till the day he died, he said that he was with Vanzetti that day. He would later become a principal, a teacher over in uh, Quincy. Uh, uh, he taught music. And um, I think he's no longer with us now. And this is the neighborhood of, the, of North Plymouth, which was at that time very Italian. Vanzetti refused to take the stand. He refused to take the stand under the advice of his own attorney. Many people do this. And uh, the jury is admonished that this is the Fifth Amendment right of the defendant and not to read anything into it. But it's human nature that if you don't get up and defend yourself, you're probably guilty. So this was probably not a good move on his part. He later regretted it. What was the verdict? Vanzetti was found guilty. And he was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years, which was actually at that time very severe for an attempted robbery. Here's the evidence. This is what the jury based its decision on. Uh, the Winchester shotgun shell, even though there are thousands of millions of Winchester shotgun shells, he was carrying one and there was one found at the scene. The shaky eyewitness testimony, as I say, because the eyewitnesses at the time identified a man with a short, crappy mustache. And the third one was that he was lying in the police department about being an anarchist and knowing Mike Boda. So therefore, he must have been guilty because he was avoiding um, being truthful. That leads us to the big trial. By this time, a defense committee had been mobilized. They had raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, the defense committee was made up of anarchists and they went out to hire the best lawyers they could get. And they hired a fellow by the name of Fred Moore, who we'll hear about. And he souped this case up and it became a cause celeb. It was known throughout the world. And now you had newsreel cameras from, uh, from New York over here covering the case. Now also during this case, there were threats that uh, anarchists were going to descend on the courthouse and blow it up. So they actually had state police uh, uh, mounted circling the courthouse during the trial. Anybody that entered the courthouse was frisked for a weapon, which is now standard procedure. Here is the courthouse in Dedham, it still stands. And here's a little shot of the side entrance and this is where they'd normally come in. This is the scene for this next uh, film that I'm about to show you from the newsreels. This is Sacco and Vanzetti arriving. Look at the crowds. And they were just kept in the, the Dedham jail, which just was around the corner from them. Brought into the courtroom. Again, the judge was the same judge as was in Plymouth, uh, Judge Webster there. It said that he asked for the case because he wanted to show that American justice could be fair and impartial in the face of anarchists and Italian immigrants. District Attorney Fred Katzman, I guess a, another cost-saving measure was that he was the district attorney for both Plymouth County and Norfolk County. He was again on the case. And he was assisted by Assistant District Attorney Harold Williams. Fred Moore was the defense attorney. And uh, the, the defense committee brought him in from California. He was a famous labor lawyer. He was thought to be somewhat of a bohemian at the time. You can see his hair is a little bit long and swept back. And he and Judge Thayer were like oil and water. Judge Thayer was this proper Yankee. And here we have this basically this hippie who would come to court in sandals and uh, sit there in his shirt sleeves with his feet up on the desk. He would, it was said that he would sleep on the courthouse lawn during breaks. And he had a very 
contentious way of trying cases. He just objected to every possible thing he could. He drove Judge Theron nuts. They went through the entire jury pool trying to find a jury because he objected to practically every juror. And then when they got to trial, it was much the same thing. And he and Judge Thayer did not hit it off very well. Fred Moore was assisted by local attorney Jeremiah McInerney. Now, the prosecution case, much like it was in Plymouth, was witnesses came forward and uh, they testified that they either saw Sacco and Vanzetti uh, here or there. I, I wanted to point your attention to this photograph. This is how defendants were, were seated in the courtroom. And I was able, uh, during a documentary I was working on, I was able to uh, actually get this shot. Every now and then when the History Channel shows up, they bring it out of the basement and assemble it. This is where Sacco and Vanzetti set. Essentially, it's a cage. And the reason they stopped using this was it biased the jury. Because what do you think of people that are sitting in a cage? The, the uh, uh, assumption is they're guilty. So they stopped using this. They were put on trial. Uh, in the prosecution case, in a nutshell, this is what, what they had. Many witnesses identified Sacco as being one of the bandits on the rail. Only two witnesses could identify Vanzetti as being at the crime scene. One witness uh, said that he saw him coming in on the train from Plymouth, although later on the defense uh, proffered evidence that there was no ticket sold from Plymouth. And uh, another witness, um, uh, Lavangi, the gate tender, said that Vanzetti was driving the getaway car. Uh, only problem with that was every other witness, there were about 30 of them, said that the driver of the getaway car was blonde, pale, sickly looking, probably the gentleman that was standing outside Shelly Neal's office in that morning. Casman was crafty, though. He said to Lavangi, he said, could Vanzetti have been leaning over the driver's side when the car went by and you thought he was driving. And, Van, and Lavangi said, yeah, I guess he, I could have seen him. Another thing was that Vanzetti had never learned how to drive. So therefore he was probably not the getaway car driver. One witness testified that Berardelli owned a 38 caliber revolver, much like the revolver Sacco had. There was a lot of investigation as to where that revolver was. Nobody could find Baradelli's revolver. Last they knew it was being repaired at Ivers and Johnson in Boston. So the assumption was that that revolver that was taken off of Baradelli was the one that Vanzetti was carrying the day he was arrested. And then the ballistics evidence was introduced. Sacco's Colt. in the bullets. Now, oddly enough, I should mention the defense requested that they do ballistics evidence. And what happened was that the state police captain Proctor, he was just, he was just like months from retiring, took the stand and described how he tested the weapons. He said that he pushed uh, bullets through the barrel with a wooden dowel. And he was able to de determine that one of those bullets that came from Veradelli, bullet number three, was consistent with having come from Sacco's gun by the lands and grooves that he saw. Now, it's at this juncture that a good lawyer, which Fred Moore was not, a good lawyer would have said to Captain Proctor, what do you mean by consistent with having come from Sacco's gun? And Proctor was fully prepared to respond that means that it could have come from any cold automatic, semi-automatic. Attorney Fred Moore never asked that question. So in the minds of the jury, that bullet came from Sacco's gun. Vanzetti's revolver was uh, said to be the one taken off of Baradelli. There was a lot of argument about that, a lot of identification both ways. Now, when Sacco took the stand, uh, he was asked to try on the cap that was found at the scene. And this was a pure OJ moment. 
uh, he put on the cap, and as you can see, it was too small for his head. So what the lawyers tried to do was have him pull it down over his head, and a, a laughter erupted in the courtroom. That cap was not Sacco's. And later after the trial, it would be found out that that cap was actually found days after the crime. Now the defense, what was the defense? Uh, Sacco had an alibi. He, uh, when he got arrested, they said, where were you on April 15th? And he said, uh, I was at work. And when they checked it out, he wasn't at work. He was absent at, from work. And months later, he came up with this story. He said that he went to the, uh, the Italian consulate because he was applying for a passport to go back home because his father was sick. And the thing is, the, uh, the Italian consulate remembered him because he brought in this giant picture of himself and his family to put on his, port, on his passport. And they thought it was hilarious. They thought he was a real greenhorn. This is what a passport looks like. And you have to ask yourself, uh, Sacco didn't come from nowhere. He, he came from Italy and he was thoroughly familiar with what you needed to do to put a picture on a passport. So this was his alibi. He was absent from work because he was in Boston at the Italian consulate. And they remembered him because he brought this giant picture in with him. Kind of fishy. Vanzetti's alibi was the same as it was in Braintree. He was selling fish. And the same thing happened. All of his neighbors came up and testified. So Vanzetti decided this time he would take the stand in his own defense. Um, he was very eloquent. He was very uh, humble. He he talked about his story coming into America and how he experienced uh, a tough time and uh, joined the labor movement, eventually became an anarchist. And then Fred Katzman pretty much raked him over the coals when he discovered that Vanzetti and the anarchists had escaped to Mexico during World War I to escape the draft, which I don't think they would have been drafted anyways since they weren't citizens. But he went up in Vanzetti's face and said, you don't love this country, do you, Mr. Vanzetti? You left when we needed you. So he, he really buried him on that. He would do the same with Sacco as well. Except Sacco got up. He was the fiery one of the two and made this big, impassioned, incoherent speech, um, totally tearing down capitalism and the American system, saying that poor people didn't have any chance. And this just uh, really didn't go well with the jury, the all Yankee jury. The defense rested its case. The final arguments were made and the jury was given uh, the verdict. Did they, they went out and they came back. The verdict was guilty. Both men were found guilty and the evidence consciousness of guilt. Again, they were lying at the police station. Probably the most significant piece of evidence was that one bullet that the jury believed came from Sacco's gun that was found in Veradelli. Vanzetti's revolver was thought to be the one taken from Veradelli because there was no revolver found afterwards and the, 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 the goofy cap that they found there. These were the things that they based their judgment on. They were quickly hauled off to prison. And for the next seven years, there would be motion after motion after motion made for new trial. Most of these people were witnesses that flip-flopped, changed their testimony once, then changed it again. And from what I hear, they were getting pressure from both the defense and the government. So you really can't tell what the true story was. The one motion I want to draw your attention to, though, is the Proctor motion. That's Captain Proctor. He filled out an affidavit saying that when he said consistent, that bullet was consistent with having coming from Sacco's gun, he meant that it was consistent with any Colt semi-automatic. And he filed that. Now, initially, these motions for new trial were denied. And first, they were denied by the sitting judge, which was Judge Webster Thayer. And then it went to the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court and they um, 
ruled in favor of Judge Dare that these should be denied. And then there was one last motion. This is the killer, the Medeiros Morelli motion. This man you see here, his name is Celestino Medeiros. And Medeiros was a criminal. And he was um, in here. This is the Dedham Jail right around the corner from the Dedham Courthouse with Sacco and Vanzetti. They would be brought here from Charlestown State Prison when they were uh, awaiting to be heard for their different motions and appeals. And uh, he tried to approach Sacco several times to tell him what he knew. But each time Sacco would have nothing to do with him because he had actually had a spy placed in his cell, wouldn't talk to Morelli, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Medeiros. And by the way, this is the Dedham Jail today. Uh, if they have an opening, you can get a condo here. Um, Medeiros decided to take another tack. He made out a piece of paper and he gave it to one of the trustees and he said, give this to Sacco. So the trustee took it, transported it to Sacco. Sacco opened the piece of paper and he read it. And he said, this, this thing said, I hereby confess to being in South Braintree, the shoe crime, and Sacco and Vanzetti was not there. Celestino Medeiros. At this point, Sacco was overcome and he, he fell back against the wall and began to weep. He thought his long journey had ended. Here is somebody that was at the robbery, somebody that was confessing to being in the robbery and his days in jail were over. This is what happened. By this time, they were represented by two new lawyers, William Thompson and Herbert Ehrman. They had gotten rid of Fred Moore. Sacco became uh, an implacable enemy, as he would say, of Moore, because all Moore cared about was the propaganda. He didn't really care about getting them off the hook. So Herbert uh, Ehrman and William Thompson, uh, they decided that they needed to interview this uh, Celestino Madero. So Thompson came in and he had a chat with Medeiros about what he knew. And Medeiros related the story. He said, I was down in New Bedford and I was part of this gang of Italians. They run between New Bedford and, and Providence. Now what this gang does is they have a spotter up in South Braintree who spots the, the railroad cars that are full of the most expensive shoes. And when they get down to Providence, they break off the lock and they steal those shoes. This gang, this gang of Italians are responsible for this. We went up there. They, they brought me in on it. I was in the back of the car. They gave me a shotgun and they said, if anybody rushes the car, you shoot them. And he gave an account of what they did that day, where they went, uh, what he saw. And this is his testimony. And then Thompson got down to nuts and bolts and he said, okay, all right, well, you said this gang of Italians. Uh, who are they? What's their name? And Medeiros at that point, shut up. I, he said, I, I, I'm not going to give them up. I've already, you know, I've already given myself up. I'm not going to give them up too. Like he had some kind of gangster code of ethics. He would not give up the names of these gangsters. Well, this didn't stop the two stalwart attorneys. Herbert Ehrman was immediately dispatched to the Fall River Police Station. And he walked in the front door and he said, hey, you got a gang of Italians down here that have been stealing shoe shipments and they were at Liberty on April 15th, 1920. And the guy at the desk said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we got a gang. We got a gang like that, boy. And he found out about the infamous Morelli gang that was run by this gentleman, Joe Morelli. This, this mugshot was taken down to South Braintree, and many people mistook it for Sacco. Joe Morelli was the head of the group. They were gangsters that had come from New York City. In fact, uh, Joe Morelli eventually would fall away and his brother Frank would take over the family, as they would later call it. Um, his nickname was Butsy. And Butsy was probably the first godfather in New England 
a gentleman by the name of Raymond Patriarca would take after him. So Morelli was the head of this gang, and he was also assisted by another gangster by the name of Antonio Mancini, who was the shooter in the gang. Uh, he was currently in jail in Leavenworth for uh, knocking off another gangster in Broome Street, New York City, right in front of a police station. So he was arrested immediately. Uh, another one was Bieber Barone, who had several run-ins with Medeiros himself. And the, the gangster that shot the, uh, or the, the gangster that was supposedly the, the car driver was uh, Steve Benkowski. And he had actually been murdered since. So he was no longer with them at that point. So this, this was the gang, according to Medeiros, who, well, Medeiros wouldn't talk about them. This was the gang that actually did the robbery in South Braintree. This was brought to Judge Thayer. He reviewed all the evidence. And again, he denied this motion for new trial based on this evidence. His reasoning was that uh, Medeiros was a murderer. He was in jail because he had shot a uh, clerk at a bank. He was a liar. He had worked in a brothel. How can you depend on what Madero said? Plus he had asked for the, the defense committee um, pamphlet saying how much they had in their coffees. So he was trying to hitch his wagon to Sacco and Manzetti in other words. So this was, this was it. But there was still a furor all around the world. People wanted Sacco and Vanzetti freed because they believed that Sacco and Vanzetti were being railroaded by an unjust system. Here are some of the photographs of some of the demonstrations that took place all over the world to free Sacco and Vanzetti. This became the cause celeb. Here we have right outside the State House on Joy Street. There, there were even celebrities that joined in. Uh, I think this next picture is Edna said, no, this is in, uh, this is in Trafalgar Square, actually. Yeah, that's Edna St. Vincent Millay, the famous poetess. Uh, Albert Einstein signed a petition. There were petitions sent in to save them. And after seven years, this is what these two looked like. Both of them had spent some time in uh, Bridgewater State Hospital because they both had mental breakdowns. And uh, Sacco had pretty much given up by this time. Vanzetti still had some fight in him. This, this uh, public outcry caused Governor Alvin T. Fuller to look at the case once again. And he decided that he was going to do a two-pronged investigation. He himself was going to investigate everything. And he was also going to select a committee of stalwart citizens that were going to investigate this. They were going to interview everybody and anything that had anything to do with the case. And in the end, they would decide did Sacco and Vanzetti receive a fair, a fair trial? Now, this committee that he selected was called the Lowell Committee because it was led by the president of Harvard, uh, Abbott Lawrence Lowell. Now, they reviewed all the information. They reviewed all the witnesses, the evidence, the ballistics. Uh, they talked to uh, Vanzetti. Sacco refused to talk. He didn't want to participate in this. He, he just felt it was a farce. And... After all this, there was one thing that was different here. A new invention had come on the scene. The invention of the comparison microscope, invented by Calvin Goddard. He looked at that one bullet, bullet three, and he was able to determine without a doubt that that bullet came from Sacco's gun. That bullet came from Sacco's gun. Not consistent, it came from Sacco's gun. And this was entered into the record too. So no longer are we doubting the ballistics evidence. There's that one bullet. The, the committee and Governor Fuller determined that Sacco and Vanzetti had received a fair trial. An execution date was set for August 11th, 1920 and the execution was stayed for a short time. 
and then it was reset for August 23rd, 1923 at Charlestown State Prison, which is now the um, Bunker Hill Community College, the site of Bunker Hill Co Community College. And once again, it was thought that these anarchists were going to descend upon the prison. So they called out the National Guard, the state police, and they were out in force ready for this anarchist attack that would never come. 50 caliber machine guns mounted on the roof of the prison. Uh, there were gunboats in uh, the Charles River. Here's a short video or a film from the time. This is the day before they were to be executed. They cordoned off all of the streets so nobody could get near. And here's the final scene. This is the, the execution chamber. Now the warden at the time was Warden Henry. Uh, he had actually become good friends with Vanzetti over these years. And this was not a duty that he was looking forward to. Now, Charlestown, actually they, they had done so few executions, they had to bring in the expert. And that was Robert Elliott from Sing Sing who would, uh, in his career, execute hundreds of prisoners. And he was brought in to do the executions. Now, oddly enough, Medeiros, who had also been convicted of murder, was due to be executed that night with Sacco and Vanzetti. Now, here is the scene. The first to go was Medeiros. At 12.03, seemingly in a trance state, he was guided to the chair, his arms and legs were strapped in place. A headpiece containing electrodes was placed before the crown of his head. And then finally, a mask covering his eyes was applied. At the nod from the warden, the executioner, Robert Elliott, who was imported from Sing Sing, pulled the switch. The mask body stiffened, the mouth grimaced, and in a few seconds, witnesses noticed the odor of burning hair. Three times, Elliott switched on the current then the doctor stepped forward and applied the stethoscope and pronounced Medeiros dead. At 12.11, Sacco was brought in. He was led to the chair. As he was being strapped in, he shouted, Viva la anarchy, or long live anarchy. Looking around, he noticed the witnesses and explained in a calm manner, good evening, gentlemen. The electrodes had been attached, the mask applied as Sacco shouted out, farewell, the warden gave the nod to Elliot. Just as Elliot pulled down the switch, sending 2,000 volts through Sacco's body, Sacco moaned, mother, in Italian. Shortly thereafter, he was pronounced dead by the doctor. At 12.20, Vanzetti was escorted to the death chamber. He stood in front of the chair facing the witnesses and said with great, great clarity, I wish to say that I am innocent. I have never done a crime, some sins, but never any crime. I thank you for everything you have done for me. I am innocent of all crime, but not only this one, but of all, of all, I am an innocent man. With his eyes covered by the mask, awaiting the switch, Vanzetti said, I now wish to forgive some people for what they are doing to me. The penalty was administered and Vanzetti was pronounced dead at 12.26 a.m. This is the chair that they were both executed in. It's still at Walpole today. It's in a storage room. And here are the, the uh, electrode cap that they administered the death penalty with. No funeral parlor in Boston would take them, save one. And that was Langone's funeral parlor on Hanover Street, which was once in this building. 
Um, it was a small place. There were two doors, one on either side. People would come to wakes and file in one door and then out the, in the other. And here is a photograph showing people filing in to see the bodies of Sacco and Manzetti. It's said that the line went up and down Hanover Street. Uh, years ago when I was giving this lecture, uh, an older gentleman came up to me and he, he said, I hate to admit it, but some friends of mine, we, we lived in the North End and we, we uh, bet each other how many times we could go through the line. And then he said, he looked at me, he said, I still remember the burn marks on their heads. Here's another scene. And I recently discovered this, I, I guess uh, uh, plaster death masks were made of both men and this photograph was taken after the masks had been made of their faces. You can still see the plaster in the Vanzetti's mustache. A day later, the funeral was held and thousands showed up to escort the caskets down Hanover Street. They were supposed to go through the south end to um, Forest Hill Cemetery. Here are some of the defense committee members loading up the caskets into the hearses. Now the plan originally was for this great crowd to uh, hang a right and go by the state house, but there was a line of state police mounted and they were uh, redirected to go through the south end of Boston. And it was a rainy day. By the time they got to the south end, which was mainly Irish, they began to be pelted with people with bricks and stones from the buildings. And the crowd dropped down to just a few hundred that made it to uh, the cemetery, Forest Hill Cemetery. And they were brought here. There was a short uh, non-denominational, non-religious ceremony. And it was here that they were both cremated it said that some of their ashes were sent to family. Uh, some ashes are said to be on hand at the Boston Public Library along with their death masks as well. As well as this. This is a base relief that was made uh, with a quote from Vanzetti. And uh, it's kind of ironic, the gentleman who made this was Gutzon Borglum, who was the designer of Mount Rushmore. Uh, to my knowledge, it's uh, still in the Boston Public Library. There are some folks that want to have it taken out of there and mounted prominently in some place on Hanover Street. Uh, I'm not sure of the progress of that. So, it was with these two deaf masks that I leave you. Thank you for uh, zooming out tonight and taking part in this uh, talk about Sacco and Manzetti. Thank you. Very good. Very interesting and sad. Very good. So sad. And I can uh, get out of here. If we want to do some questions, were there any questions? Oh, gosh. I have a question. Didn't, yes. uh, didn't one of their children, was there something later on about declaring them innocent by one of their kids, oh. family members? Yes, yes. Um, that, that you're probably referring to Spencer Sacco, who was, uh, I believe, Sacco's uh, son. And uh, there was a petition made to Ju Governor Dukakis. Now, Governor Dukakis, or no governor of Massachusetts has the power to posthumously pardon somebody. He made a proclamation that they had received a, an unfair trial and that no stain should be attached to their name. Uh, so a lot of people are under the impression that they were posthumously pardoned, which they were not. Anyone Thank else? You. Gloria? You've got to unmute yourself, Gloria.
should be down in the left-hand corner of your screen. Got it. Is that yep, okay? There you go. There you go. Yep. Uh, wh why do you think they were executed? What is your feeling? Why, why do I think they were what? Executed. Uh, the real reason behind it. Yeah. Uh, I think <clears throat> at the time, if I, I'll tell you, if I was on that jury, uh, them being anarchists and Italian aside, uh, that one bullet, I think, would have been the, the linchpin for me. But today, let me tell you about that bullet. Uh, back then, they were pretty loosey-goosey with evidence. They didn't have what, they have a strict chain of evidence protocol now where evidence is locked up. If you want to look at the evidence, you have to sign it out. Back then, Police could just walk around with the stuff in their pocket, take it home, do whatever they wanted. So uh, the authenticity of that bullet, I question. But to that jury back then, they believed that that bullet came from Sacco's gun and that would have placed him at the robbery. And uh, Vanzetti, uh, I think the evidence against him was very, very slim. Mm -hmm it was almost non-existent, but uh, somehow he, he was convicted too. And that you could probably chalk that up to uh, bias against Italians and anarchists. Did you ever check, did you ever find out whether Sacco was at the law of Warren's history, um, <coughs> Rose's strike in 1912? Cause I think I under, I found Yeah, I, are you talking about the Milford strike? No, the Lawrence, Massachusetts, 1912, Bread and Roses. Story. Right. Um, to my knowledge, I don't think, I'm not sure he had anything to do with that. I know he was involved in strikes in Milford. Vanzetti was involved in the strikes at the Plymouth Cordage Company. That's why he was no longer working there. He was a fish peddler. Um, you, may, uh, you may be right, vaguely, vaguely, vaguely. I think maybe he had something to do with that. Yes. There were a lot of people that did, and he was in the country at this time. So uh, the likelihood is he did. But I, I know most prominently he was involved in Milford at the Draper Company. Thank, thank you. Christopher, thank you. we have a question. How old were they when they died? Um, I, I believe... Um, probably in their early 30s. I think they were both in their 20s when they were arrested. And um, how many, did they each have children? No, Vanzetti was single. Uh, uh, Sacco was married. He was living in Stoughton. His wife's name was Rosina. Uh, they had uh, two children, a boy and a girl. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Inez was uh, the girl's name. Okay, thank you. Very thank sad. You. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the thing is, it, it all happened in our backyard. That's what attracted me to it. And, um, you can visit all these places. Your research is wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank it was you. very interesting. Thank you. It's, it's been uh, 25 years of research. So. Oh, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Fabulous job. Thank you. Very thank you. Much. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Okay. I, I hope my maiden voyage was okay. It was, it was, it was kind of hard to gauge. It no, it's excellent. excellent. Yeah, it's it's hard excellent. when you can hear people and see faces. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Good night. No, more, no more questions. No more oh. comments. Are there any more? Um, I don't know, um, oh. Lucille. I'll stay up uh, all night with you if you want. Yes. Yeah. No, Lucille. Rosetti, are you still there? Do you want to say anything? Wait a minute. No, she's being shy. Oh. <laughs> well, do you want to say something, Laura? Okay. <laughs> I'm being was, shy. <laughs> was, it, was it Lucille's um, uh, grandfather that was one of the anarchists? It's um, her husband, so my father's um, grandfather. Yes. Yes, Giovanni. Some that. interesting stories. Those people are very fascinating people. Mm -hmm. I know it had something to do with the Wall Street bombing, too. It was all yeah. around like, those investigations that he was found. Yep. Yeah.
Um, there's a great book out there by Paul Avrush about the anarchists and their whole society, uh, the kind of undergroundness of it. It's a very fascinating life, you know, very bohemian life. Mm -hmm. uh, Christopher, how would it be different in a trial today? Is one oh, of the questions. Yeah. Um, well, I think today everybody would be saying, oh, where's the DNA? You know, uh, today everybody expects some kind of DNA evidence to cinch it. Uh, and we're less likely to convict on uh, circumstantial evidence today because of that, because everybody watches CI, CSI. And I, I know some police mm -hmm. and they complain about it because everybody watches that stuff and thinks there should be DNA evidence on everything. Well, I think there's a lot more research today than there was right. then. Right, and uh, some of the some of the legal um, um, systems have changed a little bit too. I'm not quite sure that the trial judge rules on motions of his own trial. I think uh, that just goes to the Supreme Court without even stopping at that point. Well, it was almost a case of uh, proving yourself innocent. Uh, they, uh, they were guilty. That's it. Right. My family was also involved in all of that. My grandparents and all of these anarchists and basically was understood throughout the Italian neighborhood and community that Sacco and Vanzetti were innocent mm. of that murder. They were anarchists. And, right. And uh, Sacco's widow was taken in by my grandparents because she was ostracized significantly by yeah. society at that time. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, and yeah, father, she ended up, she ended father, up um, in uh, Bridgewater, I think, uh, marrying a fellow anarchist. Yes, I know who that is. Just yeah, that's another chicken farm. Farm. I, mean, I, I don't want to mention their name. But. Yeah, I, I forget the name, so I can't throw it out at you. Uh, and she died in a nursing home in Brockton in the 80s. Yeah. yeah. But my father tells me the story about how Sacco reached through the bars the night before he was going to be executed and yeah. rubbed his head and he said, now you'll be a good boy now. Yes. You, uh, but, uh, mm -hmm. And uh, my grandfather on the other side, and the Italian picnics were really meetings of the anarchists. And yeah. Which yeah. was the red flag uh, yeah. uh, song that everybody knew. And they were really socialists. They weren't really anarchists. They were fighting for the labor for, for the sweatshops. Yeah. They, they, um, they were what you call philosophical anarchists which Sacco and Vanzetti claimed to be, and then there were the violent ones like Boda, but they were all part of the same group. So uh, socialists, socialists believe basically that the government should control everything, and anarchists are diametrically opposed to that. They don't believe government or anybody should control anybody. Everything should be um, consensual, so to say. They don't believe in bosses. They don't believe in judges. They don't believe in corporations. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of a, a nice way of thinking, hoping that if you, they believe that if you removed all these shackles from people, government, that people would just work together without all the police and all this around. So, uh, the thing is, how do you get rid of all the government and all the bosses and all the capitalists? There? Christopher, excuse me, but did one of them write something very poignant from jail? Yes. Yes, um, uh, I believe Vanzetti, uh, there, were, there were many letters that they wrote back and forth to people. Uh, the last night he did write a letter and uh, that, that part of that letter was on that base relief statue that I, I showed you. Oh, okay. It was very poignant, I understand, yes. very eloquent. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's very ironic that the Charles Street Jail should end up a cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, they tore, they tore it down. Um, I guess by the 1960s, it was really a, you know, rat house. Yeah. Uh, another famous prisoner there is uh, Malcolm Little. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah. Malcolm X. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but they had ex they had escaped from the Italian king of Isoberto, who was. Uh, Could they have escaped? When they escaped from Italy, when they came from Italy, uh -huh. they were escaping from a very bad go government. Right, right. They did. They th they thought they would be um, come to a better place. They thought it would be different. Yeah. 
Do you think there's a possibility that they were, were, were um, executed because they took part in the 1912 Bear Moses strike? Um, if if it, they were executed for taking part in anything, it would have been uh, the in the bombings that you heard about. Yeah. Um, I think that was directly related to it. That was certainly in the forefront that they were part of this group that was involved in all these bombings. Yeah. Even though they had no proof that they, those two were directly involved. I have one. For an object question. lesson. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is what happens to you if you do this. The lesson, yeah. Christopher, how, how does this feel during your program this way as huh. opposed to doing it at the GAR Hall? What I, are your, how's your I, feeling about it? I like doing live performances. Uh, not, nothing against you tonight, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not used to this, uh, staring at myself I, with these glasses. I look like Darth Vader. <laughs> You did fabulous. Yeah, um, I I like the the good old fashioned lectures, but um, hopefully I'll get better at these. Uh, it looks like I've got a whole bunch of them lined up for October. Um, it it's kind of weird. Well, unfortunately, uh, if you did have a live performance, we'd all be wearing masks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I right. know. Yeah. I don't. You I don't know what to do worse. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Put big Thank smiles you. on your masks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so, so much. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't wait till it gets back to normal, but it seems like it's going to last forever. It's, it's just, oh, wow. kind of, mm -hmm. it's depressing. I think mm -hmm. we're in for a little haul. Yeah. Well, thank you again and good night. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Christopher. Thanks, Gene. I do. Yep, Thanks, Gene. and we'll see you back in November for okay. a presentation on the, um, you know, the sixteen twenty. Okay, we'll we'll do the same thing. We'll set up the Zoom a little early and uh, yep. get everything organized. Okay, I think great. it went nice and smooth tonight. Oh, so good. Um, I'm glad. I was worried. <laughs> no, no, I think right. it went great. Have a good night. All right, you two. Thanks so much. All right. Bye bye. Good night, bye -bye. everyone. Thank you.